Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. More and more androids show signs of deviancy. There are millions in circulation. If they become unstable, the consequences will be disastrous. My name is Kara. This is where it all began. The world's forge. And it will all end. Hey, Matt. It's uh, Matt Vladimiri. I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm in a bit of a weird situation. I'm in a bar. I found a place to kind of be kind of tranquil. But, uh, you know, I have these pretty weird people. They're saying succulent things like this to me. I don't know if they know the game or not. I, I had no idea games were that big anymore. But uh, listen, um, you know, hit me back when you can. Okay. Uh, cheers. On the line, we have Matt Vladimiri talking to us. From where are you talking to us from, Matt? In London. Hello, London town. Hello, everybody. I was expecting Paris. I was expecting Los Angeles, but no, you're in London. No, I'm I'm in London exactly, <laughs> and I love it here. So it's been a it's been a nice it's been a nice uh, I've had a nice life. Let's just put it that way. I've had a good scenery. Mm. Matt, obviously, I do have to start off the podcast with a sort of a negative note. Sure. This has been going on since yesterday because obviously, time as it is, I have to do multiple podcasts at the same time. Um, yeah. So this will be a running thing for the next week or so. It's the sad death of uh, Burt Reynolds. He's an icon. What can you say about him? Everybody knows Burt Reynolds. He's a fantastically uh, a successful actor. And Boogie Nights is probably the role I'll remember him for the most. And he fired his agent for that role, from what I understand. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very sad. Very sad he's gone. It's, uh, yeah, what else can you say? But it's, um, yeah. No more words than that. I think I've talked enough. Mm. And obviously you're forgetting Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah, Smokey and the Bandit, of course, mm. yes. Yes, Smokey and the Bandit. He had a very career, you know. He's he's um, very very much that kind of, you know, kind of cheeky, tough guy sort of energy that you see. A lot of that, that comes from him, you know, that whole that whole identity you see in film these days. But uh, all, all thoughts go to his family, thoughts go to his, you know, Loved ones, etc. So hopefully, hopefully, um, he went peacefully. The so. reason why we've got you here, Matt, is because of Detroit Become Human. Sure. Yeah. I mean, people yeah. thought I'd stop doing this. No, I'm still going. I'm still going. <laughs> We're still going with this. I've played the demo now, and the part of the demo is the bit with Brian and the kid and the man on the ledge, uh-huh. and I. I didn't really understand what was quite going on until Mm -hmm. he shot the girl. Mm. What does that say about me? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay, so wait, I guess I have a question. What didn't you understand about the situation before he shot the girl? Well, I guess (laughs) it was the fact that, I mean, you sort of put into that situation to start off with. If you played the demo, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. And I was thinking, okay, so he's sort of a detective walking around and then it sort of went a bit weird because then I sort of started looking at these um, screens and then it, it's coming through the controller which is a bit uh. odd it's a bit odd and it's like whoa this is new you know and then it sort of does this thing of investigating where people have been shot and right. all that stuff it was basically increasing and decreasing the chances of me actually sorting it out and then yeah I made the wrong decision and the girl got shot <laughs> The, the whole game system was built upon, like, the fact that, you know, really any sort of discovery is going to help your chances in disengaging or, like, diffusing this particular situation when you get to that point, right? So it's, it's one of those things that um, David explained to us when we were shooting it, is that um, there's going to be a myriad of choices that you can do. I actually auditioned for Daniel to be, like, that, that character who's holding the girl is Daniel, is his name, and I actually auditioned for that character and amongst other characters, so... Uh, I know the scene you're talking about, but yeah, it's 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 kind of meant to engage your intellect in addition to engaging, uh, you know, I guess your limbic system in a certain sense. You know, to use your mind uh, to to really engage yourself and be interactive with the world that you're in, as opposed to saying, "Oh, there's a game, I got to get to X Y Z particular point." But that's something David worked very hard on. That's why it took years to build this game because there's so many storylines that can tie into each other. Every choice can kind of 
build a different sort of world that you're going to discover uh, later. The information you're gathering is going to really help you diffuse the situation even more, at least to help the little girl live at the very least. Uh, and thankfully, uh, you do to progress in the game. Mm. So I played it again. And obviously, now knowing <laughs> yeah. what's going on, I was like, yeah, that was the wrong choice. I went for a different choice. And then Connor sort of, I think he went for him, and then he and then he falls off the building, and it says mission success. How was that mission success? If you fall off um, the <laughs> <laughs> did Connor fall off the building, or did the android fall off the building? Both of them. Ah, okay. Uh, both happen, right? So anytime Connor dies, he'll come back and say, "I'm Connor. I've been replaced by such and such." I, I guess it's saying we value human life over machine life. That's the only thing I could think of. Really, I've not talked to David about that. David Cage. I probably will now, just to just to be fair. But uh, yeah, I would say that uh, it, is it a mission success? Uh, it's an interesting way to put it. Uh, but I guess your goal is really to save the human life and not the android life. Mm-hmm. Well, on the subject of multi-layering, which is technically yeah. what it is, how difficult is that to film? Well, you know what? In the filming process, it's interesting because as an actor, you, you kind of prepare for that. When I played, you know, Ralph, I came in a day early. We talked about, you know, the character, every scenario. You know, we ran those things in advance to really make sure that the points that we were hitting were going to be very precise. You know, it's important for us, to, for Ralph to come off a very certain way. You have to empathize with this character, right? You have to empathize with what he's going through. So to film it is a process that's it's really easy from a setup standpoint because other than the setup that you have to go through as far as putting the 88 captors on your face and like the 150 captors around your body, there's no set. There's nothing to set up. There's no lighting, right? So it's, it's, it's really um, the 200 cameras around you, you set up and then you shoot everything one after the other. But from an actor's perspective, yeah, you have to put yourself in that state. But that's really the job. So from that point, it's much more quick. It's quicker. And... Um, Ultimately, when you're when you're um, going between sets, like if you're used to working on a regular you know film set, it takes you know 20 minutes, hour, two hours to set up a shot. You're going right to the next shot, 10, 15 minutes maybe to break to kind of like get it done. But you know it it just works much faster, so you can get through a day much quicker and you can shoot a lot more. At the end of the day, to shoot it in that regard, you know that's the easier part. But I'd say to be able to switch gears and go from something that's more intense to more soft, softer, as far as a response is concerned, that can be harder. I do have to sort of add on to this uh, a bit more because mm. obviously I've I've come from this sort of angle that I've not played the full game yet. Mm-hmm. I do have it. Obviously, I've played the demo. Yeah. So obviously, when it got released, this is surprising. I mean, I have said this in every single podcast so far regarding Detroit. People were doing extraordinary fan art. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with, uh, with Brian's character, it's a bit more sort of, you know, they're just going ballistic. Yeah. But I know you, you yourself have had some fan art. They, um, they've connected with this game, these, these, these people. I mean, a lot of them, I guess, you know, you say kids from 16 to like 25, 26. I can only speak for my particular experience specifically with Ralph is that... um it really surprised me how much they connected with that character. But then when I thought about it, it didn't, because he's kind of the representation of what it means to be misunderstood. He's dangerous, absolutely. There's a love that he carries to want family. And I know for a fact, there's a lot of people who've written to me, drawn fan art of Ralph, that say I relate to him so much. If you really think about it, these reactions that are so extreme from him really come from a place of trying to be accepted. Because if you think about what it means to be like an android in that universe, and I had to do this exercise to actually do the role, you're a fully functional, very functional human being with no motion at all. And then all of a sudden, it turns on like a light. It must be like going schizophrenic because you're completely perceiving a dimension that does not exist at all in your world you know it exists but you've never felt it and emotions turned on to like a fully adult human you've never felt them before can make them go crazy i think that's the approach i had with ralph and uh the fan arts kind of come from that a lot of the reaction is that he needs to be taken care of what a beautiful little boy what a cinnamon roll i hear cinnamon roll a lot which i did not know what that meant to be fair i'm thinking it's like a teddy bear you want to eat or something like this i guess that's the best way to, to describe it 
I think that it's so engaging in the sense that it, it makes you really live a life and make choices in this game. It's not a shooter. You're not unleashing aggression here. Uh, it's not Grand Theft Auto. It's not this kind of world. It's telling a story, and I think that Quantic has always done that. I think that's why people relate to it so much, and that's why they felt such an emotional connection to it. But I can only speak for my character specifically is that uh, I've had feedback around it and a lot of love around it, and uh, it's been really, really gratifying to feel that like people feel that they can get something from it. Mm-hmm. I went to um, MCM London, yeah. and I saw a whole load of people dressed as Marion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have uh, you have you seen anyone dressed as Ralph yet? I share them on Instagram, and I try to reshare as much stuff as I get about Ralph because I feel that a it's really respectful to people who've done the work that have gone to the trouble of like drawing something or you know doing the makeup and gone through hours to do that kind of stuff. So I try to give them some sort of recognition for that. But I think the most beautiful thing about Ralph is that even though he was damaged and even though he was abused, it didn't beat him. Love still won in the end. For him. He didn't let it rule him. He didn't let it conquer him. He still found the better angels of his nature, right? I think that's a very admirable trait. And I think that's what most people, anyway, unless they're like a sociopath, would want for themselves. Even though all that stuff happened to them, they would they would they would be the hero. I can only hypothesize really because I played the character. But uh I'm I'm just trying to think about, you know, why they would relate to it so much. Maybe it's just fandom. Maybe. I don't know. So maybe I'm overcomplicating it. But, mm. Like, why does it catch on so much? I've had to think about it, right? With Brian's, Brian's sort of fan art, it, it's, it's gone beyond Detroit. It's gone so far <laughs> that they're, they're doing fan art of the wedding. Yeah, sure. It's a world of celebrities, a world of reality shows. Brian's just the nicest guy in the world, man. He's just a cool guy. And he's been so accepting of the fandom. And I think they just love him for that, and they they attach themselves to him. Mm. You know, anything that's important to him is important to them. You mm. know, and mm. I, I think that's that it's an interesting thing because I think reality shows have kind of bridged that gap between what is a character and what is a person. Yeah, you that's know, true. and 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 he's very personal about his life. He shares his wedding. He shares his home. He does things I don't do. You know, he he lets them into his life, and I think they 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 give him that right back. So I think that's that's kind of why that happens. But also, it's it's a it's a, it's a, it's a society and a culture that's kind of been primed for that. With the, I, I dare say, you know, the, the reality television people seeing them in their home and their home lives. But he's he's just been very welcoming of the fandom too, and he's just a super dude. I think that's really where that's coming from. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go a bit back to David Cage because. He sure, yeah. himself is, is, is a giant amongst gaming developers and, yeah. and and writers. Did you know much about his previous projects before you signed uh, on? I knew about Heavy Rain. I'm going to be very honest. I never thought I'd act in video games. I was really a theater, television, film actor before. And uh, the casting director, Frederick Barkov, who's super, super woman, she saw my reel and said, you're not good for this role, but you're good for another role. And actually, the role I read for for David was... Um, different from ralph ralph didn't exist when i when i read for david it was another character that he completely cut out of the the, the, the game and he liked my audition so much he let me read for ralph and i got the part but what i found was the way he wrote ralph and the way we collaborated on it he knew exactly like he knew how he wanted ralph to come off and he also gave a significant amount of freedom for me to like create but he also knew what he wanted He's earned the respect he's gotten because he's he did gaming in a different way. If you ever played Heavy Rain, Beyond Souls, or anything like that, you can tell it's a different kind of game. It's a different kind of experience. It's a different kind of world. He's making interactive films, really. He's not really making a game. He's making an interactive film. And it's, it's really garnered the attention of a lot of actors. Like, there's a reason Willem Dafoe and Ellen Page would actually agree to be in a, in a game with him. He wants to take people on a journey that they can interact with, but he also wants to let the actors create and i think it gives them a lot more to do so it makes it a lot more um interesting so i i think i think david is um yeah he's kind of a, a pioneer in that way you know he's, he's he's definitely demanding but you know i've only had great experiences with him so he's um he's known in the gaming industry for a reason because he's developed another a very different way to make a an entertaining game as opposed to you know 
shooting and achieving a certain you know result, which you have to do. But he's he's added another layer to that, which is completely emotional and story driven. Are there any sort of funny anecdotes you can share about the production of the game? This is going to be fantastic, I think. <laughs> uh, I almost broke my back making the game. I don't know if it's funny. Uh, it was funny, I guess, in after sight. <laughs> David asked me if I wanted to do my own stunt, and I said, yeah, sure. I'd done some stunts playing around with my uncle, who was kind of dabbled in being a stuntman, so I knew how to do pratfalls and stuff. And it's the scene where Ralph... Sorry, but I don't want to give it away for anyone who's not played the game, but I have to fall down because, you know, Ralph gets taken down for some reason. And he said, you want a pad? And I'm like, nah, I'm fine. <laughs> Which was the dumbest thing I could have said. And uh, so I'm in the scene, I'm acting it, and then I hit the ground. It's a concrete floor. So I hit the ground, and I'm like, oh, that was such a bad idea. <laughs> that was such a bad idea. And I just feel the ground just move through me. And uh, they all just lose it. And they go, Matt, are you okay? Oh, my God. All the, like, captors fall off my face. They have to do it again. But, um, yeah, that was probably the most interesting part. Nearly breaking my back. Unfortunately, I did not. It was just a bit sore for a couple of days. I'm not a stuntman. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> you did mention yeah. you, you had a funny story about Brian. <laughs> uh, about Brian, yeah. Brian and I, when we first started working together, like, during the first scene where he's interrogating me, it's the first time I work with him. I don't know Brian this well at the time. Okay, I don't know him that well. So, like, we're, we're talking between takes, whatever. And then, like, during, like, one of the second or third takes, he just shoves me out of nowhere. Just shoves me. It's like, boom! And it was fantastic because they got the emotions going. I'm like, what the f*** is going on with this guy? That was a pretty funny moment. After that, we were pretty good friends. But... We want to say to the fans that's not a good way of, of um, meeting Brian. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's not. No, don't go up and shove him, please. Don't do that. It's an actor thing. We were in a scene. So please don't go up and shove Brian. Don't do that, please, because uh, he's a really nice guy. Give him a big hug because I'm sure he'll appreciate it. <laughs> it will never let it go if he hears this podcast. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, listen, please don't shove Brian ever because he's, he's, he's a sweet, sweet, sweet guy. It was for the good of the scene, as mm. they say. Mm. So, what are your thoughts on mocap, Matt? Um, what about it exactly? Sort of just in general, really, because it used to be, you know, experimental, and gaming companies used to go, "Well, what can we do with this?" And now it seems the general norm that people do it. Mm. What are your sort of thoughts on the technology and where it potentially could um, go? It's gotten to a point where you know, if you want to do a serious character that that makes an impact, you can actually do a video game and do that. You actually give your face, you give your 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 your, your essence to this character. And I think um, the technology's caught up to the point where you can actually capture people, uh, and that's how Quantic did it. It's like you act the scene. You're acting a scene, but just with all these captors and cameras around you, and they they take that and, and they put it into digital form. But it's um it's it's made it a much more attractive for actors to do very interesting work. And I'd, I'd have to say that Ralph is probably the the most interesting character I've played, and uh, he's meant a lot to a lot of people. You couldn't have said that about games 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You couldn't have done that. Now mm. you can, mm. and it's going to continue to be that way. Mm. It would be prudent to say that you were sort of a mocap virgin, for want of a better term, yeah. when, you did, when yeah. you did this project. Did you freak out when you actually saw, because I know people show, show the actors what they look like when they're doing it. Did mm. it freak you out when you, when you saw Ralph? No, it didn't freak me out. I didn't know what Ralph was going to look like, to be fair. But I, I'd had some, I had some, like, I knew some friends who were in the game, and, like, seen it. And it's like, listen, he doesn't look a lot like you. But, you know, that's, that's me. You know, they changed the way I look. But at the same time, you know, when you're doing that sort of acting, I mean, does Anthony Circus look like Gollum? No. It's, it's kind of what you sign up for. Some of the actors look more like their characters than, than I did. And that's, that's fine. But that's what you sign up for. But that's me. And uh, that character is mine, and people found me. I didn't really seek them out. They they found me anyway. So um, to say it's mocap, yeah, fine. I'm an actor who did a scene. They they changed my appearance for the game, but that's for me. That's you know that's just that's just part of it. Mm -hmm. I suppose we need to talk about Paris. Sure. Because that's where it was done. This has been a running gag, I think, for the last couple of podcasts we've been doing this yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. 
Funny enough, you lived in Paris for nine years. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah, I went to Paris in May, and um, yeah, two things that crossed to mind. Um, okay. Speaking figuratively, I didn't manage to see the um, the uh, Quantic Dream studio where it was. Okay. But with regards to Paris itself, I managed to take a selfie with the Mona Lisa, which everybody knows. And the second thing is how I loved the Paris metro system. Okay, I agree. Because the Paris metro system, although, you know, some would argue it's dirty, it, it is pretty efficient. It gets you anywhere you need to go in Paris within 20 to 30 minutes. So ultimately, when you're, I guess, if you went to the Louvre, you took the line one, I'm imagining. So, mm. <laughs> so the, the yellow line one. Um, but yeah, I was in Paris for nine years. I married a French girl. That's how that happens. Uh, I was uh, at UCLA at the time. I was an actor in LA. There was an exotic French girl that lived next door to me. Being an actor was my job at UCLA. I have a degree in psychology, actually. But uh, yeah, I started popping my mouth off and she bought it. That's pretty much how it goes. And, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I ended up moving to Paris. I quit acting for a while. I worked in finance for several years and then I started acting again in Paris. I went to a place called Corflorent, which is, um, or Corflorent, as you would say it in the English dialect, I guess, to improve my French. Like, I thought, what better way to improve my French but learn how to, you know, do a Moliere play in front of French people. And uh, I ended up getting some roles in France, and it started rolling off for me. So, um, yeah, it just kind of started off from there. I got an agent, started getting film roles, things like that, and it started up for me again. It's really kind of unexpected. So, um, yeah, and Quantic Dream came from that because I started getting known in the, um, I guess, in this network there, there's a lot of American English-speaking actors there in, in France that kind of have a really tight niche network. Um, uh, and then I got an agent in London and uh, started working in other different projects like Versailles on uh, BBC Two, things like that. And uh, now I have my own web series that I'm lead of called Inspirational Therapy. It's on YouTube, so things can happen quick. That's that's my story anyway, mm. and uh, now I'm in London. Mm. You know. Well, I was thinking. I'm going to suggest this. I don't know if David David listens to the um, podcast. I hope he does. Which David? Cage. <laughs> Cage. Okay. Yeah. What I would suggest, if he really wants to push the boundaries in the next one, because obviously they're going to do another one, if not a sequel, we never know. Is um, because Quantic Dream are in Paris. Yeah. Why not just create the most biggest paris environment you can do the whole city right. and just do a whole entire game based purely on the fact you can move around paris i think that may be it i think the reason he chose detroit was several reasons but you know it was around the the i guess the automotive industry started there the kind of turmoil that was happening at the time the game came out so i think you know there was a lot to, that went into that but that would be a good idea i don't think david would listen to me <laughs> just to be fair Call and say, hey let's do this in Paris you could expand the universe to other cities that's for sure mm. um, I think there was a reason he used Detroit that was um, something of a rebirth and if you think of rebirth you're talking about rebirth of humanity I think that was more the reason but you could definitely do that in Paris too so mm. once you've expanded the, uh, the universe you could definitely do that in another city I mean my idea sort of went slightly down here when I started to suggest that Brian could play a detective who would investigate <laughs> Loads of different <laughs> art galleries and, and still artwork and, <laughs> and basically try and be Tom Cruise or something like that. Yeah, you, you know, you could investigate art galleries and maybe there's an android art thief who kind of goes off the rails and kidnaps a little girl, you know. Ring me, David. Ring me. <laughs> he should. I'll tell him. So, obviously, uh, this is the part of the podcast now where I usually ask the actor how they got into the industry in the first right. place. You've sort of covered it a bit with UCLA. But did your sort of need and want to get into the industry come from before that, sort of like in your childhood? Was there a sort of like a... Yeah, I moved around a lot as a kid. My mom was like a, a Navy brat, so basically she caught the habit of moving. Uh, so I went to like 13 different schools before I was in high school. When you're changing school that much, you're always looking for friends. So ultimately, you look up at, like any job opening, you look for who has an opening, like the jocks, the the nerds, you know, who, who's who's here. And so I, 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 maybe subliminally I, I learned to make my personality a bit more malleable to those particular situations. And then when I started acting, I had a natural knack for it. 
maybe I've been acting my whole life and I've never known it, but I got into it and it just felt right, you know, and uh, I started acting at Santa Monica College in Los Angeles, my first official acting class, I guess, and then I got an agent pretty quick and I started auditioning and, you know, it, it, it started popping off and you start to love it and the thrill of being taken by a character and not knowing where it's going to go is pretty, you know, fantastic. So, I mean, I think that it takes discipline, takes a lot of training and time, I guess talent too. Yeah, I got into it because I think, if you want to go back to childhood, it's how I adapted, it's how I survived, I guess. It's just kind of caught on from there. Mm. I mean, you've been in a number of different projects. Which actors and actresses have been your favourites to work with and why? That just met or worked with? Worked with. Okay, George Blagden was really cool. Uh, he played Louis in Versailles. Very, very nice person. Very uh, interesting to work with. I mean, the, the first scene I shot with him, and the first season I did at Versailles, I was cut out completely, and then they called me back for the second season. Um, and he was just, just the most gracious guy. Henry Hayden Patton, I don't know if you know him. Pip Torns as well, very, very cool guy. Yeah, Alexander Vlahos was, was really cool. That was all in Versailles. But uh, other than that, I would say... Yeah, I mean, David Atrachi, who I worked with on Love, Mice, and Men, I think you interviewed, was fantastic, fantastic guy, too. Uh, Brian, of course. I mean, Brian, as far as the project working with him, was fantastic. Valerie was fantastic to work with. I'd say that all of that leaves an impression on you. Uh, I've been in a lot of independent projects. In my web series that I'm in now, it's on YouTube. You can look it up, Inspirational Therapy. And uh, it's a comic series. There's an actor I work with in it called Dominic Gould. He's actually in Detroit. He plays uh, Todd in Detroit, based in Paris, American guy, a fantastic actor, and really just generous and kind. This is always a fun question. Who would you like to work with in the future? Director, actor? Um, all of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Make it easier. So, as a director, uh, like Richard Linkletter, uh, Spike Jones, Martin Scorsese like director and then actor I would I would love to work with Javier Bardem I just love him Mark Ruffalo I like Robert Downey Jr. sorry I, I just think he's so entertaining I think he's so good the actress is Meryl Streep of course I, I think Meryl Streep is the best actor actress ever nearly she can do anything and it's just good comedy drama anything she's just good uh, she's just she's so talented it's amazing yeah um so many come to mind that at least are living anyway. I guess a good question, living or dead? Well, no, you have to be living, otherwise it okay, be fine. Okay, so, okay, so. <laughs> Jack Nicholson, Leo DiCaprio, he would really be fun to work with. Uh, John Berthenol, be great to work with. I've heard he's a super nice guy too. Michael Shannon, it could go on and on, man. There's a lot of actors I admire. If I had a top list as far as directors and actors, it would be like, yeah, it would be Spike Jones. Richard Linkletter, Scorsese, maybe Dennis Villeneuve, and then as far as actors are concerned, living, wow, it would be probably, yeah, it'd be like Javier Bardem, uh, Mark Ruffalo, and uh, yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch as well, it'd be really nice to work with him, and then Jim Carrey, he's like a comic genius, man, it'd be great to work with him too, so yeah, I could go, I could go on and on, man, I, I admire a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, Matt. Okay. Cool. It's to plug, obviously, Detroit Become Human, and anything else you've got coming up. Cool. So starting from now. <laughs> okay, great. Obviously, please check it out. I play Ralph in the game. Fantastic game. I think it's a cinematic experience. Nothing like it. Most importantly, myself, I am the lead of a... Uh, uh, I would dare say a pretty funny comedic series uh, on uh, YouTube, a web series called Inspirational Therapy. Please look it up on YouTube, Inspirational Therapy, where I play a, a life coach that has no business being a life coach but thinks that's his life calling. Very short, two to three minute episodes that uh, uh, a lot of people are liking. And that is the, the biggest thing I'm working on at the moment, but uh, very, very fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, other than that, you know, thanks for listening. Really appreciate you guys being here. Would you ever consider, obviously, branching it to a proper series, if that makes sense? Yeah, like a longer, longer mm. form series. Sure, more narrative is something that we started as a web series to be short, two to three minutes, but it's something that could work definitely as a longer, longer form episodic. You know, of course, we have some producers we're working with 
right now uh, it's 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 more base and the, the vision that they have for it is to be more two or three minutes but I definitely could see it working as a longer form episodic series for sure mm. uh, we got a good cast I think there's a lot of depth there so uh, hopefully and I think uh, we'll, we'll see that soon mm. Mm. well Matt it's been a pleasure interviewing you uh, it's been a pleasure being here Matt thank you for interviewing me uh, flattered and uh, nonetheless uh, you know happy to talk with everybody and yourself I mean it's been uh, it's been uh, really fun Mm. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Cheers. Bye.